Hi everyone, welcome to Tea Table Talk. I'm Ashley and I'm delighted to be here with artist Louisa Kirspin. Hi Louisa. Hello. Are you welcome. Happy to be here. Welcome. I'm delighted to say that Louise is joining us from her wonderful studio in Kent for part of the Wild Acres Week 2022, which is an event hosted by Green Sod Ireland, which is a land trust dedicated to protect nature for nature's sake. So Wild Acres Week, for any of you who's not aware, is an event that's going on all this week. It includes wonderful workshops, talks, um, both online and in person, and then a couple of these wonderful tea table talks. So thank you so much, Louisa, for joining us. I'm delighted to have you, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation about some of your wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. So I suppose we'll just uh, dive straight in with one of the things I was really interested in and had contacted you about in terms of the biodiversity event that we're doing Wild Acres Week was your wonderful project Flight Path, which I understand is a community project focusing on bees. Do you tell me a bit more about that? It's um, it started probably through lockdown. Really, I got involved in um, various correspondence projects and I was also having a solo show in a community building and part of that brief was to be able to do community events so workshops talks um, with people unfortunately the project um, took place the sorry the exhibition took place um, just at the very tail end of lockdown and the venues weren't really open properly and which meant that we weren't able to do workshops so um, I decided through having done various online um, mail art type projects that I'd have a go at launching this one as, as part of that project and it had just an amazing response so the concept is that um, I've done some drawings some mark makings on some um, lengths of paper and when I was trying to work on that paper, trying to add insects um, and wildlife and, and things to it, I found that the graphite marks were making me think of buildings and roads and, and generally barriers to nature. Back in 2017, in the early days of me drawing, I went on a course with a lady called Nikki Gammons, um, learning to identify all the different bumblebees that we have in this country. And the biggest takeaway that I took from her talk was the fact that we've got very good at doing nature reserves and providing very careful habitats for very specific um, pieces of nature. So, um, but what we weren't allowing for is how insects and animals would be able to move from one nature reserve to another. So we, we create, in a sense, we created barriers and she was very keen to break down those barriers um, and create wild, what she called wildlife corridors. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that can happen as a result of um, things being um, shut into small areas. I mean, we've got the obvious ones with fires and floods and um, that can devastate a population. Uh, but there's also things like she was talking about bumblebees um, if they don't get diversity they can go sterile and then you completely lose your um, your collection in that particular area so her projects were really focusing on finding ways to make the landscape all around the nature reserves capable of providing corridors um, and these concertina bits of paper that I'd created that were put out as a project um, just reminded me of those nature corridors and that's where the, the name flight path came from. Yeah, because I think um, as an artist myself, you know, the idea of this folding concertina, this and this small piece that you could put in your pocket in a sense was a was one a beautiful, I think, represent, representation of the size of the insect that you were looking at but then as you said this yeah if there was a lovely movement in the pieces and, and, and anyone watching them um, we'll put in a link to um the project so people can have a look at it but this lovely idea as you said of the consultina which gives a, as you said this barrier but then also a free flow movement so i thought your choice of how to represent it was wonderful and the and and the idea that so many other people were making these little flight paths 
was such a beautiful concept. Yes. I like the fact that when it's folded up, you just catch glimpses of the insects. And that's how it is in nature. When you stand in your garden and you look around, you'll see an, an insect will fly in and then fly out again. And yes. you just get a, a quick look at it. So that, that spoke to me. Which as an artist, can I set those be sometimes a, a bit uh, <laughs> infuriating? You're trying to look at these beautiful patterns and it's gone. It's like, wow, what was that magic that just came into my garden? Yeah, it's it's yeah. interesting you mem you might mention the barriers because there's an awful lot of conversations around, you know, bees and trying to can help the insects. Um, but there isn't actually a, a, as much talk about those edges, um, which in bio biodiversity in general is a really important part. You know, the edges between grassland and forests and the edges between roads and where nature starts, that there's such biodiversity in those little sections that we we almost forget. We do. And it, it's it's been a long time coming. I can remember probably 20, maybe even 30 years ago, we started to see these bright orange little signs on the roadside. And it turned out that they were about protecting that piece of roadside verge, um, just for the habitat that was within it. Those little signs are still there, very faded now, but we don't seem to talk about it anymore. Yeah, yeah, put the sign up, it's done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have the same. We have a few little, you know, posts that says, please mind this area for, for wildlife. But it would be wonderful, I think, yeah, to, to get those conversations going. And I, I think that's what was so wonderful about your project is it was creative, it was visual, um, yet it can, you know, and it connected obviously with another project that and inspired by that so that, that it can create a conversation. Did you did you find that that, that was the case or? <laughs> The conversations were just absolutely mind blowing um, from the, the letters that people wrote when they sent the pieces back to the conversations that started on Instagram. It's one of the few instances where I felt that Instagram has been so positive. Um, it built a little community and people were commenting on each other's posts and learning something. It, it became, I think, quite competitive to find something new in your own area to then share with other people. And the joy of sharing it was just so wonderful. I think that's how I started, really. I wanted to be able to share what I was learning um, as I was finding out things. So, yeah, because I think that um, you're reminding me um, there's an ecologist, she's no longer working with Green Sod Ireland, but when I connected with Green Sod Ireland originally, it was um, for the desire to have, to, to kind of bring it, an artist myself and Jeannie, the ecologist who specialises in bees, to go out for walks and just exchange how we saw the landscape. And, um, and it was a really interesting, we spent about a year just meeting up here and there and mm -hmm. At first, you know, as an artist, I would zone into the little colours and the sights and the sound. And I was taking a very slow meandering walk and Jeannie was walking quite quickly. And I remember being a bit frustrated by that. And then she was frustrated with my pace. And then we swapped over. I tried to put on the head of the ecologist and her the artist. And what I learned was that the she was documenting um, the bees, but she had to walk fast to keep in front of their flight path so they would go from flower to flower so in order for her not to record it at that particular one again she had to move with the bees and um, which was a real interesting eye-opener for me for like different special specialists and different people looking at different parts of nature have to almost get into the rhythm and understanding of that particular species and move with it accordingly. So again, it was another interesting thing about the, the net, your, your title, the flight path, because again, when you start to observe nature, you see that, you know, a, a butterfly has a very different way of navigating than a, than a bumblebee to, you know. And, and even within species, they have a different flight pattern. Um, Red admirals are much more aggressive than other butterflies, so their flight pattern is quite jerky and fast. Um, whereas cabbage whites, for example, will tend to just sort of dilly about most of the time and then settle back down and then go off again into another tumbling. So, as That's an if you, as you become more expert in learning about um, the insects or the, the creatures that 
that you're following, you learn to know just by the way they move. And that's really fascinating. Yeah. And I understood that from birders. Birders always talk about the gist of, of the, the creatures, don't they? They see something mm. in flight, they know what it is because of the way it moves. Yes. I hadn't appreciated that applies to insects as well. It just shows how important it is to slow down and observe that we've lost yeah. that art of connecting with each individual species. A bee is a bee, a butterfly is a butterfly. Whereas, as yeah. you said, there's these wonderful nuances to each one. Yes. And the product. Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, I, I recently become quite obsessed by crane flies and I was really shocked to discover that we have 350 different species of crane flies Gosh. in this country. And that just was mind blowing. I expected it to be maybe 10 or 12, you know, but, but 350, it's wow. just incredible. That's a whole lifelong project in itself, yes. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's so yeah, gosh, that's that's actually quite that's a huge number. Yes. Because even the amount of bees that we have, I, I don't know the figure exactly myself, but the, the number of bees is it's about 275 yeah, just... if you take all the solitary bees into account. I'm I'm not sure how that overlaps with Ireland. Um I think I'm talking UK figures, but uh, yeah, so but we have 25 bumblebees, one honeybee. Yes. Uh, the honeybee has become this poster girl for, for um all the wildlife and pollinating, but it's much, much wider than that. And that became actually very important to me that we were talking about the wild creatures not so much the ones that became very popular in terms of um hives and honey and and keeping it it was like well what about the rest that's a very yeah. small proportion of what we're dealing with i think you've hit very much on a one of the reasons why we have wild acres week and um one of the really strong ethos is behind Greensod Ireland is that idea of protecting nature for nature's sake. And it is often the honeybee or other animals that can, in a sense, provide us a service that we focus on, as opposed to seeing the wider web and how important all, all of them are and that they, they are giving us something in a very in a different way. It's not that, you know, just food. Uh, so I think you've really hit on a really important topic that um, this particular event, the theme is deepening our connection with nature um, in a way that we can look at the reciprocity relationship and that interconnectedness and not just like, oh, nature, we can cut down its trees, we can take its, its honey. So, yeah, you've touched on a really important point there. Do you, for yourself, then, the, the project... Um, is it still going? Is it something that you um, would like to continue? And do you feel, did it, what did it? <laughs> what a wasp come. Oh, did you? He's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what about me? <laughs> Don't forget me. <laughs> the, the project was absolutely amazing. It, it launched with my solo show, but we then had an opportunity to exhibit it in uh, November last year at a local, at the same local gallery. So people were able to come back and see the work. People traveled from a long way having been part of the project. It was absolutely amazing. And it was just too good to stop at that point. So I reached out to Ace Arts in Somerton, um, which again is another community type arts project building in Somerset. Um, and they've agreed to have the exhibition held there from the 22nd of October through to the 19th of mm -hmm. November. So we're just at the moment talking about um, whether I do some talks or some workshops and, and how we continue to spread the message as part of that. They've always been really good about holding nature exhibitions. I came across them through the 50 Bees project, which was run by Lydia Needle, um, where she handed out um, to 50 artists, 50 of, the different, of each of the bumblebees and encouraged us to do a project on that bee that she allocated mm -hmm. to us. And then they were all shown as a collection while she did um, little needle felt bees in, in containers alongside the piece of artwork. So it was a fantastic collaborative project that, that spoke to so many people. Beautiful. And then I think you, from what I can see of your project as well, it's doing the same thing. It's 
certainly seems to be yes yeah. <laughs> it's been mind-blowing I really didn't expect much out of it when I first started it but it's it's the way everyone's joined in and and I think lockdown helped um, people were a bit more focused they were sat in their gardens or they were doing short walks around their environment and they started to notice things that they'd not noticed before mm. so it was sort of timely really and I yeah I hit a zeitgeist moment which was fabulous but it, it's still people are still talking about it they're still taking part they're really keen to have another go and mm. it's just been fabulous fantastic because maybe you can spread it globally <laughs> well it did it did definitely there were people taking part from New Zealand um, mm. Australia a small group um, a lady took a collection out to an art group in Princeton New Jersey in, in America and they held um, an exhibition in their local library there um, and involved um, a can't think of the name of the charity but of the insect charity in Xerxes I think I'm not sure how you pronounce it in America so they linked up with what was happening in their own environment Fantastic. which was absolutely mind-blowing. Wow and if people want to get involved in the project is it something that you're still d doing or? Still doing yes um, I, at the moment the, the pieces that I have been sending out I've asked to have back by the end of August sort of early September so that I've got time to prepare them for the show but I'm always keen to have people get involved and anyone that does get involved I then um, I'm happy to share it on my Instagram and, and build it back into what everyone's doing and I don't think um, Ace Arts is going to be the last exhibition for this it's it's too important there's too much there with it it needs to build and grow so Anytime anyone wants to join in, I'm more than happy. They just there's a, a page on my website which I'm sure you can put the link to, um, which gives the instructions on what you need to do. And it's very simple. You don't need to be able to draw. You just need to be able to look. Um, and maybe you know you can cut out people if you've done collage. They've cut things out of magazines. Um, they've done sewing. They've written poetry. It, it's you know ev everything has been tried on the bits of paper. But I'm sure someone can come up something else that's new yeah I think that's the beauty of the project it's not about you have to be an artist it's about really getting people to observe and awaken their senses to nature and you know as you said there's this really important topic around the barriers we create between spaces for animals to move um, and we see it on a much bigger scale like when we drive in along and we see hedgehogs and and foxes mm -hmm. flattened sadly on the road like that's the same we don't think of it in terms of the insects but you know the insects hit into our cars we we, we create as you said big buildings and cities and we just we don't take in um yeah the movement of of even the tiniest creatures and it doesn't mean that we have to curtail what we do as humans we just have to design with them in mind yeah as well and and, and all those movements i think it's a wonderful project and i definitely we will put the link down here and i'll really encourage everyone to um either get involved or at least have a look they're absolutely exquisite little pieces of um you know a biodiversity stories first of all thank you so much for bringing that wonderful project to life because I just it is such a gift I think to the world personally um, and I will definitely have a look to get involved myself I think it would be rude not to after I do the, the, the first um, time I discovered it actually was this time last year when we did our first Wild Acres Week um, we had two wonderful ladies who set up a wild coast postcard project come and um, do a workshop on their wild postcard project, um, which again, I put, I, I've got the link there for people to have a look at. And one of the um, ladies who was part of your project, Anne-Marie O'Rourke, who's a wonderful artist in Leitrim, she um, sent us a wonderful photograph so that's how we first heard about your project and I've been following it ever since so but as an artist yourself I'm very aware that I really want to find out a bit more of your own work like I'm I'm I feel very privileged to have a glimpse at the moment into your wonderful uh Kent studio there and some of your beautiful work behind you so that's really exciting um so I'd love to find out a bit more about you know your own work as an artist and what draws you to nature 
Oh, that's difficult. I think I've always been drawn to nature in one form or another. I grew up in a small village. I mean, probably it's one of those villages that people have heard of because of its National Trust basis. So I grew up in Sissinghurst, right on the edge of um, orchards and hop fields, and then across those straight into the woods. So that was always there. But, but growing up, I was actually much more interested. It was there, I was absorbing it, but I wasn't conscious of it. I was much more interested in sport and I was very active um, and I was quite mathematical. So I studied um, sciences and maths um, and eventually worked in an insurance company um, as a systems analyst working on computing. Craft was always there in my background, so weekends would have been spent um, learning to make something with glass or metalwork, and eventually when I had children I started working um, with silver, so I was a jeweller um, making silver jewellery for about 13 years, and then I discovered that I could draw through practice. People always say to me, oh I can't draw, I can't draw. Well, I, until I was 45, I was one of those people, I can't draw, I really have no skill set. And my answer now to people is, well, just find something that you are really interested in, and you will, and then just practice. And those two things will bring you into the world of either drawing or painting or, or something creative. It doesn't have to be drawing. Um, so I was 45 before I started drawing and the the trigger for me I have always worked small I've always looked closely at things I um, gardening was um, a, a strong craft for me during the time that the children were growing up I spent a lot of time in the garden with, with flowers and plants always keen to include birds um, and insects and when I started drawing um, botanical art was what really suited me but it takes a long time. Botanical art is very slow and I needed something to practice a bit more with. Um, and that was, that, that's where the insects came in. I, I found some bees in the garden and started drawing from the specimens. Um, so, and then gradually, I think the insects have taken over now, um, particularly through lockdown as I started to observe more. I started doing things like the big butterfly count, which made me look closer at the butterflies and try to learn what it was that enabled you to identify what was actually in your garden. And the closer you look, the more you notice, the more you realise how beautiful the insects are. So that's why they, I think they've become a focus for me. And it's when I first drew a wasp um, and I started started exhibiting those I got some really negative reactions people have an intense dislike of wasps and I kind of wondered why I was trying to work it out um, and why wasps are useful why why we want them mm. so that made me look a lot further and a lot closer and find more and more insects did you find an answer to that question I think when you look at the language that surrounds insects, it's all pretty negative. We, we, we're encouraged to be scared of spiders because our parents are scared of spiders. Um, when we talk about wasps and bees, the first thing people tell you as a child is they will sting, be careful. It, it's our narrative, I think, that's that's the problem. That's why we and they also I mean wasps come out in July and August when we want to be outside as mm. well we want to have barbecues picnics and they're attracted to our sugars and our foods but wasps are really important in the life cycle of a garden they um, they're good predators they will eat green fly white fly black fly they take those to feed to their um, the, the larvae, the, the developing wasps. They clear up a lot of the detritus. Um, they, they want meat, so they take dead animals. So if you've got any dead and decaying animals, they will be picking up and clearing up that side of things. Um, and they're just beautiful creatures. <laughs> yeah. I think, as you said, when you start to observe those creatures and particularly those that we fear or dislike we can create a whole other narrative and create more empathy with them um, in that sense 
And um, yeah, it's a, it is about changing our narrative and, and, and slowing down and realizing that everything has a place. And, yeah. um, like and we are not really interested in us. They, they, I was sat earlier in the garden and a bee was right literally on my shoulder on the plant that was behind me collecting its pollen and, and nectar. And it had no interest in me at all. Yeah. Yeah, only if you sit on him, he will sting you kind of thing, yes. <laughs> yeah. But it's, yeah. And it's interesting because like say nettles will sting, yet we can make delicious soups from the nut that we'd make wash soup or anything. But that idea that there is a positive with it and the nettles have their place as well. And there's reasons why they sting. Um, yeah. You know, and it's not always to hurt us, which I think is the, the a narrative that would, would be lovely to twist around, that it's not all about coming from our perspective um, which is again a lovely um, way you're working is as you said you mentioned the idea of slowing down and nature has so many like the ants move at a different pace to, and the seasons change you know hibernation time to full burst in the summer that being aware of those patterns in nature I think would would help our own well-being as well because um Wonderful. You mentioned there about, um, which is really interesting, how the, you know, we need the wasps and even the flies came up in my mind there about, you know, they, they help with that, the natural cycle of decay. And, and it's something you had on your website, which I loved the quote, um, lost in a world of intrinsic observations from nature. I just love that phrase you put. And then um, that you were entranced by the cycle of growth and death. Could you speak a little bit more about that when I start drawing something I go into that zone um, that people talk about it, it doesn't take long and then I suddenly realize that two or three hours have gone by and I've been absolutely focused on what I've been doing and I find that now when I sit in the garden as well that when I'm observing the time moves differently now because I'm looking much closer at what's going on I'm looking, uh, it, it's little examples. You might, you start by looking at a bee and then some movement catches your eye and you realize that there's a wasp, which, you know, not your social wasp, something much more interesting or um, a moth floats through that you've not ever noticed before and you start to focus on that or, or something's just happening further in the undergrowth that you would have walked past if you hadn't, hadn't been aware to look for something else. We do an insect watch group um, at Rye Harbour Nature Reserve, which is my um, one of my local nature reserves. And we quite often, we're there for two hours, and often we don't walk more than about 200 yards because we start with the first plant and the first insect, and the closer you look, the more you see within that plant. Uh, and, you know, two hours goes by very quickly. It's true. It's, yeah, because it... So you said there's those little creatures that we, if you walk and tread very loudly, you can't notice them at all. There was, I was out in the, um, a place called Glen Cree Valley, which is here in w Wicklow uh, last weekend. And I spotted a little um, grasshopper and I, I frightened, I must've started it because it jumped and, and I, you know, went, what, what was that? You know, and then I spotted him and then it took me a few minutes to notice it, but as my eyes kind of adjusted that he was on a leaf, but there was um, a spider's web and a spider just delicately in front of him. And then I just found myself pondering again, once, watching him and watching him and thinking, if I startled him again, which way would he jump? Is he more aware that the spider's web is there than I would? So, you know, he would navigate the, the that world differently. And I was fascinated by that question <laughs> that he, you know, as humans, we would have knocked, oh, knocked through that spider's web because we don't see that subtlety straight away. Whereas he Possibly. managed to, yeah, I don't know. I was, <laughs> you know, and that's it. But I think that's exactly what you speak to when you slow down and you see a plant and then there's an insect. And before you know it, there's another tiny little ant maybe there as well. And then suddenly, and it's this whole magical world. Um, I guess. Yeah. We did um, with the Insect Watch group again, Chris converted a leaf blower into a sucker with, and it, 
it's hard to describe it, but he put it in amongst the sand dunes and then tipped out what he picked up from it. And I was absolutely amazed of how many micro insects were within that collection. We were like kids at a pond dipping, looking through all these tiny little creatures, leaf hoppers and, and smaller, they just got smaller and smaller. And for about a, a fortnight after that, whenever I walked across the grass, I felt really guilty because it made me realize how many creatures were under my feet the whole time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think that's a lovely thought though. We can go gently, they could hear us, that if we just yeah. slow down, okay, we can't guarantee we won't squash something, but even mm. them being able to hear our footsteps is... Um, oh, that's a lovely way of putting it, yes. Yeah, because I felt the same, uh, you know, a few times. And then even the Buddhist philosophy is, again, that idea of not killing anything. I'm, I'm not a Buddhist, but I'd be very interested in the, the way they navigate mm. things. And again, they that philosophy also and that care for nature we realize just just go a little quieter or a little softer and creatures can move out of the way whereas if we put on in or you know bring the bulldozers in which is how we've navigated the world so far no one has a chance it's just gone you know we're just we're destructors as opposed to carers of the of the land yeah in terms of then, because um, your work is very, it seems like you have two parts to your, your work, your, your own personal relationship and intimate connection with nature. And, and, and that drives your, your wonderful drawings and your own personal work. And then you've got this um, lovely community connection where you're engaged in more collaborative processes. Um, in terms of the Wild Acres Week, which is about encouraging action for biodiversity um, but also this year we're really focusing on that you know, building a deeper connection um, and understanding of the interconnectedness we have with nature would you have any I suppose thoughts or inspiration for other people or advice on on, on how we might be able to deepen that connection I think for me, it's been about finding a group of people that share those thoughts. Um, I get a huge amount out of going to the nature reserve. We're often talking topics that I know absolutely nothing about. And there's other people there that know very little about it as well. But you, you always come away learning something else and making a connection with somebody in a different way. So it, it, they run a lot of workshops courses that the, the big point of these nature reserves is to encourage people to learn more about nature and find out more about what's going on so I think almost all the way down the line it's been one or other course that I've been on so Nikki originally with the the bumblebee identification this week um, I was learning about damselflies and one of the people on that course we had a connection with and we found that we connected in a different way she was also an artist but we've not come across each other before so you, those sort of events I think are absolutely fabulous to go to. That's a wonderful idea actually I'm just thinking now we have Birdwatch Ireland and um, just down the road here and um, yeah as you said there's there's lots of experts out there and actually myself and my husband only a few weeks ago um, heard about a butterfly identifying walk close in our area and it was fascinating as you said you meet like-minded people or you also meet curious people like yourself who don't maybe know lots of things and then you have experts and yeah that's a wonderful idea thank you for that we were walking through a particular area and it's relatively new to this area is the emerald willow damselfly and we all said at the end of it we found about 15 of them in the end it was it's not an ideal day for damselflies, but we all said at the end, we would have walked past them and not noticed and not known that we'd seen this rare creature if we hadn't been with the experts. So it's yeah, really important. They're quite hard to see. They're the same color as the leaves that they're in. You needed someone to tune your eye in in the first mm. place. That was so important. When you live in the countryside, trees and, and plants and flowers, they just speak to you all the time. So you notice the light, you see something different as you're walking through. And I think you asked me earlier about um, 
the, the, the growth and decay side of things, most of my early botanical drawings were decay, decaying flowers. I get, I'm really fascinated by the structure, teasels when they, they've finished and you get that gorgeous structure in the winter and then the light catches on them. I mean, ignoring the fact that it's considerably easier when it's dried. <laughs> Yes. It's not going to move. <laughs> you can have it in the studio for a long time. Um, but there is something about the, the seed heads and grasses and, and those sorts of things that is just beautiful when you look closely at them. And that's what really pulls me in. Yeah. yeah, and actually there's a wonderful translucent quality that comes in. I'm thinking of flowers that I've watched go die where you can then see the inner veins and markings um, when the color is stripped away so there's that other layer of of life and death that kind of shows an, an inner another beauty to it yeah. um, so many of us are fascinated by poppies in in the spring and uh, not poppies tulips sorry in the spring when they die they do they, they do this wonderful curling and as you say the, the translucence um, is just beautiful yes yeah. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think where you your environment really sh can shape what you see, what you observe, and then your inspirations. Um, just with that, I suppose, if, if say if someone's watching now is in a very built up urban area, do you still think there's um they can observe nature in some of the Absolutely. Almost all the built up areas have got green spaces. And that's one of the things that we need to promote and expand all of those green spaces. But during lockdown, the people that lived in cities were noticing the weeds that were growing. Um, they, they were finding patches of wildflowers or insects or that they hadn't noticed before because they were too engrossed in the fact that they were in in a city. I can remember walking through London one day and suddenly hearing buzzing noises behind me. And as I turned round, there was a garden that was about the size of my studio, so a real pocket size front garden that was full of flowers. And the insects somehow had managed to find it. But when I looked around, there was nothing that, that had brought them there. How they'd managed to find it, I really don't know. And that was one of the early triggers on this, this flight path thought the story the, the journey of um, developing the project was noticing things like that yeah and we then where forget how important trees are um, a lot of the trees in London for example um, they will be pollinated by the insects the moths and and butterflies live up in amongst the trees we, we're very keen to talk about flowers mm. but a large part of pollination happens, a large part of the feeding of, of insects happens up in the trees and the flowers, the insignificant flowers that we get from trees. That's an interesting conversation to have as well, because actually there's a lot of trees get cut down here, I'm sure in other places as well. And there was um, in Dublin, you know, there's been conversations around trying to put in bicycle lanes, which is a wonderful idea from a sustainable point of view, but the, the and widening the bus lanes. But with that, there there's a lot of roads that would have to chop down all these wonderful old trees. And um, again, they're so important that, yeah, there has to be other ways. And without that knowledge, I think, and those conversations around why they're so important we can't we, you know we can't we can't move developments forward if if everyone on the page doesn't have that knowledge or understanding um while i'm drawing i quite often have podcasts or the radio on and certainly in the last two years i've been listening to an awful lot of the books that have been written by nature writers um, and i can't remember the title it off my top of my head but it was about an ancient um orchard and he was taking it through the seasons I think it was called Meadowland but I might be wrong he, he was taking it all through the seasons and pointing out how each creature that was in within the orchard how important their role was in moving on to the next year and what happened next so woodpeckers for example create the holes in the, tr the trees but the trees have to be a certain age before the woodpeckers are interested in making the holes 
those holes are then used the following year for nesting birds or nesting bees or or something you know something else so it's that cycle and the connections and if we keep chopping down the old things we don't have that we we, we lose that bit of the connection yes and then as you said the knock-on effect for all the other cre like creatures the birds that nest there the woodpeckers that feed off that then all the other insects and we it's not just cutting off our connection we're actually damaging and destroying all the other connections mm. and that's the, the subtle beauties that in nature well thank you so much for joining me today i've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation i, I wish we could go on for hours i feel like there's so many rich things to talk about particularly uh, my knowledge of insects i'd like to say is is a lot better than it is but i'm learning every day with green sod and um with all the biodiversity ambassadors I'm connecting with and then you know the work that you do it's wonderful and um, so thank you for joining us and again I would say to everyone watching please do check out uh, Louise's website the link will be down below below her work is absolutely exquisite and the flight path project is just wonderful we have a number of other events going on this week so you can check out the Green Sod Ireland website for other talks and workshops thank you Ashley it's been an absolute pleasure to spend time with you thank you very much oh you're most welcome and I look forward to joining you on the flight path soon thank you you're most welcome thank you